This is Moments of Truth, the webcast with and for customer success professionals. I'm your host, Andrew Marks, co-founder of Success Hacker. Today, I'm joined by Anita Toth. Anita is the chief churn crusher at Anita Toth Incorporated, her consulting agency, working exclusively with B2B SaaS companies. Anita uses her 20 plus years of qualitative research experience from two world-class universities to help uh, B2B SaaS companies crush their churn and increase their net profits from the bottom up. Anita's signature solution, the Churn Crusher System, helps her clients start to lower their churn in as little as 16 weeks, mm -hmm. resulting in hundreds of thousands of dollars of revenue retained. Anita, welcome to the program and thanks for making time for me today. Oh, I'm so happy to be here, Andrew. We're going to have a great discussion. Excellent. I, I, that's what I like here. I like great discussions. That's what this is all about. Um, so Anita, a challenge that a lot of customer success managers have uh, is having these difficult conversations with customers, right? It's, it's really easy when things are going well, everything's cruising along, everybody's happy. But when things don't go well, one of the worst things we can do is ignore or avoid having those those almost cringeworthy conversations that we're afraid of, that we're uncomfortable with, right? But you can't tell the customer what you think they want to hear to keep them happy. And you need to tell them, you need to tell your customers what they need to hear and, and do it with professionalism and respect because avoiding these types of discussions is a huge recipe for disaster. Sure is. Um... Yeah, at some point it's going to happen. Uh, and there's two particular scenarios uh, that customer success tends to deal with. One of those scenarios is when the company has made a mistake and now you need to reach out uh, to your customers and say, hey, we made this mistake, uh, this happened, and here's what we're going to do about it. And the other, which is I actually find much more challenging um, in having those conversations is when um, the customer isn't taking the recommended actions for their success. So the first scenario where the company's made a mistake, it's, it's often much easier. You have marketing involved, you know, emails go out, however it might be. There might be some calls that need to be booked, but there's some, you know, there's a communications plan. That's yeah, there's a communications right. plan. It's standardized. Right. But the second scenario is where CSMs are really challenged because it's, you know, they're looking at the account and it's like, oh, well, going to have to have this difficult conversation because you can see somebody is starting to, you know, go off the rails or they're just not taking those recommended actions. And at some point you got to exactly. All right, let's get to it. Um, the great thing is that there are ways that you can structure these conversations to, to make it easier. So it's not just about you know, well, let's just throw it together and see what happens and fingers crossed approach, which, you know, sometimes when we're first starting out, that's okay, but it doesn't get the consistent results you're looking for. And that's really what you want is consistency in the results. So having those difficult conversations means coming out with some sort of re resolution may not always be the best, but it, it's at least a stepping stone closer to whatever it is um, the goal is for those for that particular conversation or sometimes you have to have a couple difficult conversations before you get there so 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 what do you mean by that what what, what are these what are these 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 scenarios these approaches these strategies can you give us give us some examples or some 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 stories that explain those in a, a little bit more absolutely so one of the easiest um, things, we've all done it, there's, there's common mistakes that we make, especially when we're first starting. Um, but even somebody who's quite seasoned can sometimes find themselves making some of these errors. And I have a, a slide that shows some of these, it's called factors affecting difficult 
customer conversations. One of them, uh, there's nine common mistakes. I won't cover all nine now, but we can, we can certainly talk about them. One that's very frequently made, you know, nerves are high. Uh, people, we don't know what the outcome's going to be. We don't know how the customer is going to receive our conversation. So we talk too much. We want to fill in those gaps. We, you know, just, it's just those nerves are high. So it's learning to just calm down and prepare in advance. And I can talk about how to prepare in advance in a second, but just knowing and being aware that um, you're just, you're just talking too much. You're just filling in space just so um, because of those nerves. And the problem with that though is that it doesn't give an opportunity for the customer to really share what's going on from from their side. So instead of being a deep conversation, what ends up happening is it becomes very surface level and you never really move the ball forward and find out why they're not taking those recommended actions. Yeah, you need to be comfortable with silence. Yes. And that's a skill. I don't, I don't know anybody who really comes out of the gate and is okay to just sit there, but you have to, particularly with difficult customer conversations, this is about emotions. This is not about metrics and numbers. Sure. Those come into the conversation, but really what you're talking about is showing up and saying to somebody, Hey, we we've done this. We've recommended you do this. We've recommended you do that. None of this is happening. Can you share why? And so from the customer's point of view, uh, they might have whatever's going on on their side. And in terms of, you know, politics, culture changes, whatever it may be, but from the CSM side, there's always that, that fear of how will it be received? So we're talking feelings here. These conversations are all underpinned with feelings, which means you need that silence so people can take the information and, okay, how does this feel? What do I think about this? And also, what do I want to share? Do I feel safe enough within this relationship that we've built to open up and say, all right, yeah, I've had, maybe there's some personal problems. Maybe there's problems within the business. Maybe, like there could be any number of things, but that's really what you're holding space for. And it's one of the common mistakes we make when we're first starting out is those nerves get big. And then we end up talking too much and not allowing for that space to happen. Yeah. And that space, like you said, that space is really important when you throw that out there. Hey, we got a problem. You just got to sit back and be quiet and let them process that. What they're doing, they're saying, okay, do I feel safe? How much do I want to share? You know, and they're going through that. You have to give them an opportunity to go through that process before you're going to get something meaningful out of them. But if you're constantly talking and you're continuing that conversation, you're not giving them the opportunity to think about, you know, that giant matzo ball you just throw out and throw out there into the conversation give them an opportunity to address it give them a chance to process absolutely because remember like our perspective is vastly different from theirs yeah. or it might be very similar you don't know right. like they could be totally unaware that the situation is actually happening as like the csm perceives it it, and it could be like, it, it could just be a total shock to them. Oh, I didn't know. Because again, this, the conversation they're having with the CSM is just one of many other conversations they're having in their day-to-day life. Yeah. So, you know, they just may not have put the pieces together. And now the CSM is coming and saying, all right, we're having this difficult conversation because I'm seeing this, 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 and this. Um, yeah, they may not, they may not have put those pieces together at all. And so for them, this might be the first time they're hearing it. And depending on how it's received with some people, there's some shame. Yeah. Again, we're talking feelings. They might yeah. feel shame. They might be embarrassed. embarrassed yeah. uh, they, and then sometimes to cover that up they they might get angry yeah. or upset, yeah. or they might just not want to say anything at all. You still have to let that silence sit there to allow them to go through 
what it, whatever that processing um, is for them and to just give enough of a space for it. And this is not just a challenge for customer the customer success manager role. Right. This is a challenge that people in any sort of, of customer facing situation can have. I, I know that, that support teams deal with this probably on a more regular basis than customer success because people are calling them uh, generally because they have a problem. I remember an experience in particular back when I was an operational executive, I had a project manager that had a hard time having difficult conversations with a customer. And it resulted in a north of six figure hit to our business because this individual failed to have that difficult conversation. The, the one thing I suggest if, is if it's tough to try and, and start doing these things, we'll talk about these, these um, tools and skills and strategies. You can practice them in your personal life too. <laughs> You're going to have difficult personal conversations. Practice there. Yeah. Get good at adding a little bit of silence. Get, get good at just backing off a bit and letting the other person process what they're processing. And then you can bring it into your work life or vice versa. It all depends which place you feel most confident to, to try these different things. But certainly talking too much and not giving uh, silence is one of the, the biggest common mistakes that's out there. And happy, happy to go on with another one. This is actually, sure, yeah, yeah, something, something I used to do in the yeah. beginning. Um, and I really thought, I really thought I was moving the conversation ahead by doing this. And it turns out I wasn't. And it's giving your opinion too early. So you're just starting the conversation. You've, you've laid out what, what the issue is. You're starting to talk about it. And the custom, customer says, so, so what do you think we should do about it? Mm -hmm. It's usually framed something like that. They want to go from where you are at the beginning of the conversation. Let's just jump right to the end and, and start moving on probably because it's uncomfortable. And it's so tempting to just say like, well, I think we should do whatever it is, this, that, and the other. But really what you want to do is turn it back on them. And this is a perfect opportunity then to say, well, well, what do you think we should do? Or again, how do you feel about how things have been going so far? So it's taking that opportunity and just putting it back on them to see what they have to say. And then what that does is allow you then to, to continue adding different questions, which will delve deeper into, again, the reasons why they're not taking those recommended actions. But it is so tempting to just like come with, with the solutions that you think. And I want to say the problem with that is that without going through and actually having the full discussion from their side and you get a very clear picture of what's going on, the solution that you might be proposing might take you in the wrong direction. There might be a critical piece of information that comes out of the discussion that if you don't give your opinion early and you can go through the conversation and start exploring you might come out with a totally different solution, direction, idea than the one that you um, originally thought would be the answer. And I would imagine that in addition to that, they're not totally bought in either, right? It's one thing if you, well, you said that we should do this. You know, if you get down, <laughs> oh. the road, like, well, that's what you said we should do instead of leading them down the path. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and that's it. And then once you've boxed yourself into that, it's really hard to get out of it exactly. because that's it. They said, well, you told us this is what we should do. We right. did it. Now it's your problem. Right. And exactly. so, yeah, it goes oh. from the big problem being with them to the, now the problem being with you. And it's almost like they use that. Uh, well, what do you think we should do? It's almost deflection or transference, right? I'm going to, uh, let's, let's transfer this back to you. No, 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 no. Let's, I like that strategy. Like, no, 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 no. That's not how this works. Right. Yeah. And, and again, it, it takes practice. We've all done it where we've boxed ourselves into corners from, from doing things like this. 
you, you might make a, a few mistakes, but the point is the more you're aware of what these common mistakes are, then you can identify, all right, this is one that I, I, I commonly make. I tend to give my opinion too early. I don't really go through and uh, do my you know detective work to find out what's really going on. So this is something I'm going to do. And it's just as simple as a question like that. Well, well what do you think about the solution or the situation? And just ask like that. And they'll often fill in, start filling in that gap. And then, like we said, you can just continue to ask questions and take them down a different journey. Uh, I noticed on the, on the slide, you had, you had lack of tools. Yes. What, so tell me, tell me, tell me more about that. What kind of tools are we talking about? So there's four tools in particular that are hugely helpful when you're having difficult customer conversations. And uh, one is called stop. The other is called a positive spin. There's shift focus and then there's check-in. So I'm happy to, to tell you a little bit about them. And essentially what they do is bring the emotions, especially for uh, stop, positive spin and shift focus. It just brings the emotions down a bit. If you're finding that emotions are rising, because again, we're human, we're talking about difficult things. Like we said, shame, embarrassment, fear, anger, all those things are kind of can be present in these conversations. The stop tool is particularly helpful for the CSM and that's who it's for. It's not for the customer and is literally stopping the conversation for a second asking for just a bit of a break. So 90 seconds max, which is a really long time, but really you want to try to keep it, keep it short. And this is when you are feeling your own emotions rising. So you're getting fearful of the outcome, or maybe the conversation's not going the way you had hoped it would go. When you're starting to worry that you might not be able to solve the, the issue that you're discussing, or the biggest is where you start getting angry, particularly like we just talked about where a customer might be trying to put this back on you right. and you're feeling like, well, no, we need to have the focus on, on the customer. So the stop tool is really that because it's, Hey, this is an emotional conversation and, and it's hard sometimes to not let our own negative emotions rise. So you stop. And it is like mute. It is turn off the, the camera for just a split second. Take a deep take, breath, take a calm back. down. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then you just come back to it. Um, we're getting so used to all these Zoom calls and stuff that I, I actually think this has been a benefit to having difficult customer conversations because we all have some noise in the background where momentarily we step away. They don't need to know that the reason why you've done this, just, Oh, excuse me for just one quick second. Right. And then, and then you come back, we've all done it. So it's really to help ground you and bring those emotions down, refocus, and then go back into the conversation. So that's the stop tool. You mentioned uh, zoom and, and uh, I, I want to actually talk about that because also on that uh, on that slide I saw I saw body language and voice and sound these uh, telepresence with the, with how much advancement there's been in this technology especially coming off of what what we all went through with with the pandemic uh, there is no guarantee that customers are while they want to, to hear from you and they want to talk to you there's no guarantee they're actually going to want you even to come on to site on site and customer i think we've proven that customer success can be we can be successful delivering customer outcomes and doing it in a virtual way telepresence has become a, a, a key part of our job i like that you called out the body language and the voice and emotion or the voice and sounds and things like that because those are even more important now because we're not in front of that person physically we're in front yeah. of them in a video uh, but they are able to focus right on us right so the great thing is that like the focus the really tough thing though is that psychologically um video uh calls are actually the worst is that we don't we're not able to see all the body language. When you're sitting with someone in person, you can see their legs, you can see how they're sitting. Are they crossed? Are they apart? Are they leaning back? Like all of these things, but psychologically, these little boxes that we're in 
I can't see what's going on. I can't see what's going on just past the, the edges of your, your camera's um, zone there. So psychologically, actually what it does is it raises a little bit of anxiety. So if I hear a noise on your end, I don't know what that is. And we got to remember, like as much as, as humans have developed this prefrontal cortex and we could think about all really big things, we still function in a very animalistic level. And just being on camera like this, good for focus, really bad though for for tapping into anxieties because we can't see the full picture so for body language i'm only getting you from the waist up i don't know what else is going on and i can only see you know so far on either side of you so it 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 can produce anxiety for some people not to mention that some people still feel uncomfortable on camera now, phone calls, though, are even worse because now you have no idea what that silence means. You have, at least I can see you when you pause. Okay, I can see you're thinking. But when, um, when it's a call, I have no idea. Are you checking your phone? Did you leave the phone <laughs> and walk off? Like, I have no clue. So this is certainly better. I think if you, if you look at it in terms of tears, the best standard is in person, barring that video. And then you want to go down to phone. You really do not want to have difficult customer conversations over text. So that's either text messages, emails, whatever that like, so it's either phone or video or in person, one of those three. And the other thing to be aware of with body language is, um, it's less so some of the, you know, natural things that, that we might do. Like for instance, you cross your arms. I tend to move my hair out of the way. It's more when we're nervous, because again, these are heightened conversations. So things like looking, looking off camera, looking at something else, checking out, it becomes very critical to maintain eye contact, to be in a calm manner. Um, we, some things you're just not going to be able to control for, for example, if you're getting a little upset, your face might go red, it might flush that's okay. So long as the, the rest of you is showing that you're calm. Okay. And that you can deal with this. Use that quick stop, stop tool. If you need to take a few breaths, come back in, but, um, body language is very, very telling, or, you know, sometimes I stand, you're standing too, but sometimes you're in conversations, people are sitting and then it's, you know, the hand resting on the chin, which, can be interpreted as boredom when it may not be. So you have to be conscious of all of these things at at some level while you're having these conversations. It could even be, you know, the way where their camera is positioned. Oh yeah. They're not looking at you, but they are. They're actually looking at you. I, I have trained myself because I am like you, I'm doing a lot of, of virtual training and virtual calls i'm trained to look into into the camera into the camera yeah don't do that right they're looking at the screen so i'm looking at the screen now right but i'm you know and and so it's i i think that's also a really good thing for a customer success manager anybody in this in this type of role to get used to looking at the camera when you're talking right so people feel like you're looking at them yes so I used to do that, but I'm, I'm so, I want to see body language. I'm somebody that, that yeah. I never understood why I had such anxiety when I pick up the phone and call people and it's because I couldn't see their body language. So what I do actually, and, and this might really help. I minimize, I remove myself. So I never see myself on, on camera. I minimize and put it directly underneath the camera. And I, then I'm looking at you rather than up at the camera and then back down and up and down, which is also unnerving. Yeah. So it's pick the focus and um, establish the relationship from there. So if I'm always used to looking just slightly under the camera, then you become comfortable with that. But the, if it, I'm constantly shifting, looking up and down and to the side and something in the distance, Again, the animalistic side of us is going, is there a threat? Is there a threat? Our prefrontal cortex is going, no, of course not. It's just some Zoom call. But this is is the constant interplay that's happening. And so 
it may seem small, but it's actually quite big because it starts to layer. And that's when the anxiety might be low to start, but as these little things happen, it gets up. And then now you're talking about a tough subject that might have, you know, shame, embarrassment, anger, fear, and then suddenly things get ramped up very quickly. So you want to try to reduce those things uh, as much as possible. And, and they are, there is, they're within your control. Yeah, we, we need to do everything we can to remove the emotion. When we're trying to solve problems, yeah. we need to remove the emotion from it, right? I want to, I mean, we need to acknowledge the emotion. I understand you're frustrated with this situation, right? But we need to, we can't let that, that we can't let that overcome us or overcome yeah. the customer as well, because that doesn't, that, 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 to your point, it creates barriers. We're, we're not able to effectively solve the problem, deal with the issue, move past that challenge uh, if it's being blocked by all these emotions and people don't think straight when, yep. when, when their emotions get all, all ramped up. So, you know, we recently launched Difficult Customer Conversations Boot Camp that you're leading on our platform. You want to want to touch on that before we wrap up so people understand uh, an option for them to be able to help them get better at dealing with these types of conversations. Absolutely. So um, there's the the content, which, you know, you just learn on your own about uh, a week before we have the role plays. So the That's real value. About 90, is that about 90 minutes? Of- 90, yeah. Yeah. And then there's a couple quizzes in there as well. So between sort of 75 to 90 minutes, depending on online learning. Yeah. Depending on how quickly you go through. And then we have the role plays. So the role plays is really where the value of the course sits. You can learn all of this stuff, but if you're not executing it, having those conversations is a skill. It takes time. You get better at at them. The more you practice, the more you, you know, use the tools we talked about. I didn't get through the positive spin and shift focus and check in, but they become the powerful ways of guiding the conversations, particularly when they start, you know, and they, and sometimes they do, the conversation starts going off on a, on a tangent and you need to bring it back and focus on that main issue that you're dealing with. So the role plays allow for that. And we do the two different types of role plays, one where the company's made a mistake and the second where the CSM has to reach out to the customer and ask, you know, what's going on. And, uh, you know, they're not taking those recommended actions for their success. So we have actually two sets of role plays with those two scenarios. So you get to go through it twice and switch, switch roles from being either the CSM or, uh, the customer. And there's a couple other roles we have as well. And then we talk about it. How did it, how did it feel? What did you think? What was it like using these tools? How did it, and there we are back with feelings. How did it feel as the customer when the CSM used this tool on you so that you can start getting a sense of what, what it's like from that perspective, as well as from your own perspective? How did it feel when I needed to shift focus from what we were dealing with to something else. So it's hugely valuable. Uh, it go, wow. It goes by so fast, these role plays. And then what we do is four weeks later, we meet again and have a check-in session and talk about how things have gone between the role play and the check-in sessions. It's not just about using the tools, but there's also a commitment to making changes either around body language or sounds and those nine common mistakes. They choose three of them that are, are really speak to them, if you will. So it's not within those four weeks, it's not just sitting back and doing nothing till we check in, you are continuously looking to improve. So by the time we have that four week check in, you can go back and look and go, wow, I've really done well with this. This one I'm struggling with a bit, but I can see where I can improve on the situation. And it also is an opportunity to also ask any last questions like, oh, I thought I could handle this. I did well in the role play, but now that I'm back in my job, I'm struggling with this a bit. 
what can I do to, to help implement this particular tool or avoid this common mistake? I love that that format of uh, here's some online learning, let's do some workshops. People get a lot out of those <laughs> being engaged, you know, doing doing some sort of exercise, some sort of activity really helps them to grok what, what, what we're teaching. Uh, and then that follow-up coaching, you know, four weeks later, okay, now that you had a chance, you know, to let this percolate, you've tried some of that stuff, let's, let's fine tune things. Let's help you uh, connect the dots uh, where, where, where you, you still have gaps. Yeah. And really the greatest value is in that role play. I would, I would say 85% of the value of the, of the course is right there because it's taking everything that you've learned in the, in the content part, and now you're applying it. And you're starting to get a sense of how to use it. And then also, what do you prefer? You, how do you want to execute when you're doing this? And the discussions we have afterwards are, are just fantastic because it's really, le- you're learning about yourself is what it is. You're really learning at a deeper level about how you operate in these situations. And now that you have these new tools, okay, this is how I used to do it. Now I'm using this might feel a little awkward at first because it's new, but they, even in the role place, they can already see the value in using these tools in their jobs. And we're now going to be offering this, uh, these scenarios, both for customer success as well as customer support. Yeah. Yeah. The customer support content's a little different and it's the course is called uh, dealing with angry customers. <laughs> so that's specifically for support. Uh, the role plays um, are, are tailored, obviously one to support one to success, but we can still come together in the role plays uh, work together in, in the breakout rooms and same thing, have that four week check-in later on because One of the great things about having um, customer support and customer success together is that you can also learn what it's like from from their position. Mm -hmm. So customer success, if they've never been on the support team, can understand some of the challenges they're having and vice versa. So there's really value um, for a company if they wanted to train both teams together. So the content's different, the scenarios are different, but the role plays can happen at the same time uh, to build on that learning. And then same with the four week check-ins. Wonderful. Well, really important topic, super important that that anybody in a customer facing role is is comfortable having those challenging, those difficult conversations uh, because you're going to have them. So you need to get, you need to get good at having them. Like I said before, avoiding them is not a good strategy. So Anita, thanks for spending some time with me today and, and we'll talk to you soon. Awesome. I really enjoyed this, Andrew. It was a lot of fun and I really, fingers crossed, hope people got something out of it and, and realized that this is just a skill and anybody can learn it. 